do this. We're Kent and Renee Allen. And we moved here in 1981, so we've been here a long, long, long time and raised our four boys here. And then they left us, and but two came back. And two are raising their little girls here. So the pendulum swings, here we go. Anyway, um, we've been part of the Kimberly State for a long time and had all kinds of fingers in different pies of the steak, and we loved it. And, and um, I think it's very nice to be asked to participate in this. So we had to work really, really hard to learn how to communicate so we could come and share it with you. How's that? <laughs> We're still trying. So this is a how-to or how not to? Uh, it was just are both of them? Okay. <laughs> well, um, it is about, um, I think I'm a little, am I too loud? You're fine. All good. No. Um, it is about communication in, in marriage and family, but um, since it's about marriage, I guess the question is, um, Mother Moore, is marriage important? Yes. <laughs> good answer. <laughs> Well, why is it important? Uh, man should not be alone. That's probably the best answer. <laughs> well, I agree that he should be alone. So it's a, is it a commandment? It yes, is. yes. The instruction, the commandment given to Adam and Eve is multiplying the point of seer. And he created Adam and then Eve to be his home. And he hasn't received that man. It's enforced. And it will always be enforced. In fact, we had some uh, new revelation on that in 1970, was it 78 or 75? 78. It's called the, Proclam the, the Family Proclamation to the World. And in there, about uh, the fifth or sixth paragraph, it says something about marriage. Do you know what it says? What does it say? How about if I get it and you can read it? Want to? Yes, that's exactly right. You're right on top of it. You ready? Here, I'll come over there and you can read this. I think this is good. spend some time making it as good as we can make it. Is that right? There's a, a, uh, a commandment also in the New Testament. It's found in a couple of books of the New Testament. And it starts like this. Jesus was answering some lawyers. And he answered them this way when they asked him, what is the first and great commandment? And what was the answer? I, I can't remember your name. Brother Perry. Perry. Brother Perry, what did the Jesus answer? The first and great commandment. Well, the first and great commandment was to love the Lord to go out. To so I got a part of my dream. But then the second was like him to, to love the Lord as I said. Yes. Do you know that there's only one other person by command that we're supposed to love with all our heart, mind, mind, and strength? Your spouse. Your spouse. Yeah, as recorded in the Doctrine and Covenants, it says that very thing. So let me see if I can bring it up, and we'll have uh, somebody read that. Let's see, it's in the uh, 42nd section, but I think it's 32. No, it's 22. Here it is. 22. So, Brother Hickey, do you have that? Okay. Now you can use my... How are you doing? Let's see. It's at 42 and verse 22. Thou shalt love thy wife with all thy heart, and shalt leave unto her, and none else. So we're supposed to love God with all our heart, and who else? Our wife. And if you're a wife, then you, we can substitute a husband, can't we? Okay, good. The only two, the 
that the scriptures make mention that we're supposed to love with all our heart. Now I think it stands to reason that we should love others like our neighbor, like you have said, Brother Perry. But, by commandment, these are the two. So um, it also says in the scriptures, if you're not one, talking about unity, and in this case in marriage, if, if you are not one, you are not mine. So becoming one in marriage is essential. It's essential. And because of the importance of the relationship of marriage, it stands to reason that it deserves a good share of our time. It should have priority over other things, interests, hobbies, etc. We should allocate time to talk and to listen and to share tender feelings with each other in order to become one. So that's what we should do. It also mentioned in that verse that we should cleave unto our wife. Cleave is an interesting word. It has two definitions. You know what they are, Brother Higley? Of course you do. What's one definition? To adhere to something or to you know, like a physical cleaving, I guess. Huh? I think mean, adhere is a good one. And it has an opposite meaning. Anybody know what the opposite meaning is? Yes. To separate. So if we cleave by commandment to our wife, we're, we're becoming one. And if we don't, the other cleave will come into play. And marriage will be for time only. So we have to cleave. If we don't, then marriage will be cleaved. And we won't be married anymore in eternity. So it's very, very important. So all of us, I think, have, have experienced those days of closeness, of unity, and sometimes we felt those days of separation and loneliness. And I can tell you from my experience that one is much better than the other. It feels better. So that's what we should strive for. And we can do that by building our lives and our marriage on the gospel of Jesus Christ. On that foundation, cleave to one another, and cleave to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Sister Ellen? Yes. <clears throat> so I have some pictures of different faces of our lives, which, you know, I look at us and we, we represent most of these faces. So this is the next phase. It's a busy time, but it's just such a great time. This is a big jump to this phase. There could have been one picture in between, I think. But that time when, you know, the empty nest happens, and it's a little bit of a wind tunnel, um, and then it's like, actually, I remember a couple on our stake stopped by when we were at a different home, and they just stopped in, and they says, well, say hi, and says, well, we're going to go pick some strawberries, and then go home and make some fresh strawberry milkshakes, and well, that's the kind of things you do when the kids are gone. And we were just in the process of our youngest one leaving, our, leaving us. And I thought, oh, yes, oh, okay. I know, I had this little, that sounds good. And I thought, it sounds like, okay, we'll be fine. You can go pick strawberries and make shakes too. So anyway, isn't this just the sweetest picture in the whole wide world? I love this. There's a song, it goes, Love and marriage, love and marriage. You know that song goes together, like horse and carriage. Okay, how about love and good communication? Love and good communication goes together like a long vacation. I, I don't know. I thought, thought of a whole bunch of different little things we could put there, but that really looks like my Uncle Lee who married us and my Aunt Addie. But here is something I want to read from this actual um, source that they gave us to speak on that I think is really, really, really important because we're talking about the importance of communication. We're going to expand on this. And you can look at this couple and picture how they handle these things. Communication in marriage includes every thought, feeling, act, or desire shared verbally and non-verbally between a husband and wife. So that's pretty much 
everything, everything. Good communication is a manifestation of love. And so what would you imagine are some of the perks of good communication in your relationship with your companion? And then it spills off into others. Do you have any thoughts? What are some of the benefits? Okay, what's some of the problems of bad communication? <coughs> Go there in your mind for just a minute. And then tell me, what are some of the perks of good communication? Uh, unity. Unity. With your spouse. With your spouse. That's a nice thing. As opposed to discord. Okay, anything else? Problem avoidance. Problem avoidance. Like, it's much easier to blow out the match than put out the whole field. Remember President Monson's story? Yeah, pull out the match. Problem, avoid those problems. What are some of the other blessings of good communication? Happy marriage. A happy marriage, yes. I think there's less hurt feelings. Less hurt feelings. Aren't dependent as often. Yeah, yeah. Wonderful. And here's a really cool thing. Every married couple can learn to communicate skillfully. We can learn this. But you know what? I ever think it's something we have to learn. We don't, it just <laughs> doesn't always happen. Oh my goodness. Okay, here's another picture. We can go from this, this beautiful scene of this couple to, here we go, right there. Oh, have you felt that? I mean, there's so many things. Let me, let me read some statistics. And you can look at this poor, sweet little couple. Okay, national study of 21,501 uh, married couples over the country. The result of poor communication gives stumbling blocks to marital satisfaction. And so here are some percentages. 82% of the couples wished their partners would share feelings more often. Okay, 75% um, had difficulty asking their partner for what they wanted. 72% did not feel understood. Can you see this reflecting in them? 71% <laughs> said their partner would not discuss issues or problems with them. And 67% said their partner made comments that put them down. That one kind of hurt me the most of all of them. But, um, so, the study reveals satisfying communication as the top predictor of a happy marriage. So, it's a big deal. It's important. And when you think of those the percentages of those statistics, we're all experiencing some of those here and there. So... Let's go through four of the uh, main patterns of communication that often destroy marriages. And it didn't say that often affect marriages or often cause an issue. It says that often destroy marriages. So that's a pretty heavy word. And the two first two are kind of how we approach a problem or how we, um, anyway, verbally move towards problems. And, and the first one they have done is criticism. And it says that attacking someone's personality or character is what that is. It's the definition, usually with blame. And I think, okay, um, we don't like to do that, attack the character of the person that we love and are married to. But we often make little criticisms like, you know, you know this isn't the way I like my eggs cooked. I mean, there are, that is not a good combination that you're wearing right there. I mean, so a lot of criticisms can come into life that don't necessarily attack their character, but they still kind of barb a little bit, you know? They still kind of give a, um, a sense of not being accepted by your spouse. 
And then on a heavier level is contempt. Did I just lose it? Is it contempt. And this is a big one, the bigger of the two. Insulting or demeaning the spouse. Like, you're stupid. Why would you do that? You know, that's disgusting. You know, so do you see how one is probably a little the a precursor to the other one? But the things that you say, and then not just what comes out of your mouth, but the timing of it, the tone of it, the the situation involved. You know, no wonder they use the word destroy marriages. Because those aren't good. And the next two are kind of the reaction to um, things people say, your companion says, and what's defensiveness. Now, this is my favorite one. Re okay, in responding defensively to complaints, criticism or contempt, by making excuses, <laughs> I, like, I like to check out. I'm, you know, I can think of a good reason. <laughs> whatever it is, you know, that, um, yeah, pass, pass that blame over there. Anyway, but denying, it wasn't me, you know, or arguing, you know, going that toe-to-toe, -to -toe, and that arguing usually comes with the kind of voices you really don't want in your home. Whining or counter-blaming, you think I did this, oh, let me bring up the list. And there's always some kind of a list somewhere that can be brought up, right? Okay, because we don't live with perfect people. And then stonewalling is the next level of that. And that's where it's just like, shoot, we're done. That's it. I'll talk to you. We'll see when I talk to you. <laughs> we'll see. But so these are destructive ways to talk to each other and these are the things that we need to eliminate, you know, get rid of and go into this mode. You know, so let me talk about, just for a little bit, the most important aspect of communication. Have you ever gone, I mean, we've talked about um, and you know, like, is it more be given a class? You know that we've talked about how to meet the needs and know the personality and characteristics of your companion and stuff like that. We've done that before. There are a lot of those. I've read a lot of good books. There are grand seminars. There are podcasts. There are there is so much information out there that we can take advantage of, but none of it will make any difference or do any good if you don't soften your heart. Can you see that? Okay. A willingness to forgive and ask for forgiveness. Now what is harder, forgiving or asking for forgiveness? You know, I, I think it's easier to forgive someone than to, you know, that ask for forgiveness means I have to, I have to own I have to own this piece. And so, anyway, so you have to start thinking about how you feel in your heart. Here is something, you know, I was going to bring a little demonstration. We have a lot of grandkids in our house today. <laughs> and a few things just kind of, uh, if you take a piece of cellophane and you wrinkle it up, you know, you can take it and make a wad of it and it'll go crinkle, crinkle, crinkle with every little time you squeeze on it and make it into a ball. And that kind of represents your heart when, when you're going through, you know, some challenges. And, and that's, that's what your heart is kind of like. And, and there's, you can feel it. It's a physical feeling. What you can do, just as fast as if I had that in my hand, just let it go, release it. And it'll immediately open up that cellophane that you've crinkled. It doesn't want to be crinkled, 
You just prickle it is the only reason why it is. Just let it go. And allow that softness to come. You can do that in a moment. You can think, oh, my heart's starting to feel a little prickle, prickle. You know, it's, it's starting to do that. And it's like, I don't want that, so that's the person I love right there. You know, we're going to figure this out. We're going to talk about some things. And, and my husband has some different ways to do that. But I would, here's an interesting statistic. So we need to eliminate those destructive things. And keep our hearts soft. But there is a ratio, a magic ratio, that says when, it's called five to one. So it says when positive feelings and interactions occur five times more often than negative interactions and feelings, the marriage was likely to be stable. And I thought, I, I, I read that and I thought, okay, five to one is the ratio, the limit. It didn't say when you get rid of all the conflicts, but when your ratio is five positive to one negative, <laughs> supposed to like get rid of all the negative but when you think about it I don't you know in our life there are so many miscommunications on a daily basis it, it's amazing especially when we're preparing for this you know just being a little more aware because I mean sometimes he's talking to me and I'm running water you know like we're brushing my teeth with an electric toothbrush or I'm in the closet and he's in his office, or, or um, I look like I'm listening, but really my mind is not listening. <laughs> or, or I'm coming from left field and he's pitching from right field. There are umpteen times in a day when what what we're trying to communicate just kind of goes like that. And I decided with this preparation that that's just kind of normal. It's what are we going to do with those moments that matters? And here are some things that um, couples have done, that do, couples do. But if you are a couple here tonight, I have a little exercise for you Why, while I go through these. Because, um, okay, if, if we were at our house, we'd put you in the hot tub and we'd have you like rub each other's feet. Oh, we'd, you know, it was over. Okay, <laughs> all right. Um, later tonight, you know, the grandkids are at bed sleep. But instead, I want you to rub each other's hand. I want you to take a turn, okay. So one of you rub his or her hand for just a couple of points and do, do this like a hand massage. Okay, like, oh, yeah. like, I love these kind of things. Just kind of go through those muscles and down the fingers and come back here. Okay. And do that and you two, you're, you'll have to wait until you get a foot rub later. I'm just doing that. I don't know, me too. All right, so here we go. Here is a picture. Let's see how it goes. First one, show in, showing interest in what their spouse had to say. Now, we talk to each other all the time, but are we showing interest in what we have to say? That's a big deal. And, and especially when we have our cell phones and we have, you know, we're, we're doing things. You know, can you stop long enough to give your companion your attention. The TV's on, or, or think about that. Okay, so that's what they're doing there. They are focused. I like it a lot. Oh my God, that's right. Okay, here's another one. Being affectionate through acts of tenderness, holding hands and expressing loves. love. Okay, now we hold hands a lot. We try to hold hands frequently. You know, if we're just sitting by each other, why are we not just holding hands? It's kind of nice. And so be mindful of 
of, of expressing love, maybe tapping on the shoulder, pulling the ear. You know, you might have your own little your own little things that you do. Okay, now you can switch to the other person. Okay, you're gonna switch hands. Okay, we go to another one. Here is this one, and it is showing as the spouses show they care through small acts of thoughtfulness, occasional gifts, and telephone calls. So I'm thinking about you. Here's a little gift. You know, and, and how are you doing in your day? You know, I have a little break in work. How's it going? So that means a lot. I don't know what the thoughtfulness is going here, but these were hard to find pictures of. <laughs> we're just imagining. But that does look so thoughtful, doesn't it? And I like this. Showing appreciation by expressing thanks, giving compliments, and expressing pride in your spouse. They're just throwing appreciation and compliments back and forth like crazy in this picture, don't you think? <laughs> but doesn't that make you feel good? Boy, you look nice tonight. That as a compliment, wow, I sure appreciate you going to work. You know, you work hard for us. And I don't care which one of you that is. I appreciate you mowing the lawn. I appreciate, you know, let, let's, let's be appreciative. Some things are so part of our routines. Like Ken appreciates his magic sock drawer. You know, so, and he'll tell me that. Anyway, so now you can switch to the other hand of the other person. And this is a stock photo, as you can see. Showing concern when your spouse is in is, uh, trouble. Now this is kind of dramatic trouble. But when you are troubled in any sense, isn't it nice to have a concern? You know, someone say, well, are you okay? I noticed you're limping a little bit. You know, what's what's going on here? You know, they're, they're just, the look on your face isn't quite, you know, what I'm, you know, but where's that smile? You know, you're looking tired or, or, you know, those kind of things. Okay. And then, Oh, okay, this is a funny picture. Oh, but I thought it was a real good picture, so excuse the giant tattoo, but you know, the tattoos are part of life now. But it says, being empathetic, showing you understand and feel what your spouse is feeling. I just thought that that was kind of an empathetic picture there. Yeah, I understand. You know, it was like real, yeah, a real connection there. So that's... Thought that was a good picture. And then being accepting. Oh, you might have to switch to another hand. A hand, is there a hand that hasn't been rubbed? No. Okay. My, my, my hand. Your one hand. Okay, <laughs> here. Being accepting. Letting your spouse know that they are accepted and respected what he or she said, even when they disagree with it. You know? We don't agree on everything. We agree probably on most things, but I am me and he is him, and, and we agree probably pretty sure on the things that are eternal. You know, those things that are really key and important in our lives. And here is one joking around and having fun together without being offensive. When we say without being offensive, I think that means sarcasm. Sarcasm has no place in any really happy marriage. So, um, I thought that was a fun picture. But, you know, most of us shouldn't try this. Okay, but there are other ways to have fun. You know, um, we play puzzles. We do puzzles together sometimes. But, and then this one. Isn't that cute? Sharing joy when excited or delighted. And I like that. I like that one a lot. So... These are just ways that we can replace those negative communications with positive communications. And I'll turn it back over to my husband. Well, that one hand, you have to feel, feel very good, but don't get that other one there. Oh, do you know what? I missed a real important one. Oh, you better get okay, it. this wasn't on the list, but I really feel like, and you don't have to, I'll take it. We should have.
have, we should communicate through our, our, uh, our family traditions. You know, I think that there is a communication. There are some sacred things in our marriage marriages that need to be part of our core traditions, like couples prayer, you know, family prayer, um, even, you know, family evenings, um, gathering at a certain time with, your, with our, our loved ones, or even holidays, you know, things we do as a tradition that I think is a very um, bonding and binding thing. I agree. So, Brother and Sister Dimitri, would you know, we just met. You need to pass one of these out to everyone and anyone that needs a writing tool. Would you pass a writing tool out? Oh, that's mine. That's your writing tool? That's right, no. This is my picture. So, um, when you get your piece of paper, you have an assignment. The first assignment I want you to do is um, to write on the piece of paper. And this is what I'll have you write. Something that you admire about your companion. If your companion isn't here, write it anyway and show him or her later. So, one thing you admire about your spouse, you can do a lot of them, but just write one thing. I won't ask you all to share, but uh, maybe somebody can share if you'd like to. So if you're going to write one thing down, try, how would it be? That I want to speak? Is that I like about you? Yeah, I admire. That I admire that yeah. you love me in spite of me. <laughs> I sure do. <laughs> uh, no, I, 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 I love your faith. I, I like that one, the uh, first one too. Love and admire your faith. I like I wrote down how uh, organized you are and how nicely you keep our house. So did you write one down with your degrees? Yeah. Is it something you can share? Is it? Yes. Uh, life is very kind. I know her, she is. Anybody else? Anybody else? <coughs> Such a Perry? You have one that you can share? He is a very hard worker. He's a lot of hard Isn't that a great uh, thing? You make you feel good that she appreciates that. <coughs> sure it does. Anybody else? Brother Jackman, what'd you write down? Outside of uh, having to go take care of animal uh, <laughs> messes in the yards, but no, loving to the scriptures. Good. Okay. She's a great teacher of the scriptures, too, and she speaks. Enjoy it. Anybody else? Did you write one down? Or did you write this something you can share? Good. Were you showing that? Share that with you? With your you told Got to tell me again tonight. Anybody else have one to share? Can you give him his hand, bro? That's good. Go ahead, Billy. Uh, committed. I like that one too. Very committed. So now um, I'm going to have you write down something else on your card, and this is one thing that you would like to change in the way you communicate with your companion. One thing that you would like to change, if there is one. Some of those things that uh, Sister Allen wrote down, criticism, that was one. Do you remember the four? Contempt? Yeah. Stonewalling. Stonewalling. Criticism and offensiveness. What was that one? I can only remember. On this one? I can't remember the third one either. Or the, actually, the third one. <clears throat> one thing you'd like to change, if you could just change something in the way you communicate. You don't have to share that one if you don't want, but if you'd like to, I'd be happy to listen. We'd all be happy to listen. Yes, Sister Howe. I think one of the most important things is being a good listener. You can't communicate if you're not listening, right? And my husband is a perfect example of that because when, when you stop, he can stop and actually focus and listen to you. That's pretty rare, I found. I have trouble doing it. Right? I have to really focus, wait, I need to stop and listen. He's excellent at it, and I think that's really helped in our marriage with our communication. We have excellent communication because he's taught me how to listen. Does that make sense? It does make sense. I think that's uh, 
a critical thing. Too often in a conversation, we hear, but we're not listening, because we're forming in our mind the response that we're going to make before we hear the whole, uh, the whole point of the, the, the uh, discussion. We're immediately already forming a response. So we have to listen, don't we? Very good. Anybody else want to share one that they, they'd like to change? I got one. Oh, go ahead. Yes. So I'd like to be more of an open book with my wife. Like, if she doesn't ask, I'm going to the same way. I think that that's a good one. We're going we're gonna to mention that a little bit later. But why do you think that that would improve the communication in your marriage if you were a more of an open book? I don't think probably. I think that that would be definite. You know what happens too often? I'll give you just a, 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 a scenario. I think it might have been mentioned in here that the husband loved to play golf and he would stop after work or leave work early on occasions, maybe many occasions, and go to the golf course and play golf without telling his wife. Well, he would tell his wife, I had to work late without telling her the whole story. And when it was discovered that he was playing golf, what do you think that that uh, did to their relationship? Yeah, because he hadn't been honest with her. It would have been better to do what? Tell her, hey, I am going to play golf after work. Yes. And then as a couple, talk about it. How often can you go play golf? Because playing golf is not a, a bad thing. But if you're doing it every night, leaving work and then not telling the truth about it, that's not a good thing. So it would have been a, a discussion to have if the couple had learned the appropriate tools to do it. Yes, it's right. And as far as being an open, open book, most men tend not to be open books. I, and there are exceptions to that rule, but I remember the days when we used to travel to Boise and, you know, he had a Always in his life, he's always talk, was talking to people, dealing with people, working with people, and so sometimes it's kind of nice, you know, to not have to talk, you know, to just to sit and be quiet and stuff. But me, on the other hand, so those, that two-hour drive, there were a couple of times this happened on the two-hour drive. You know, sometimes usually I'm just talking, 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 and then it's like, why well, don't all the talking? Like, it's not, I don't know. He's not saying anything. And, and so I quit talking, um, just kind of as a little bit of an experiment, sort of. And he didn't talk. He was sitting there driving, smiling, holding my hand as we drove to the temple. And I'm sitting there thinking, well, doesn't he have anything to say to me? Doesn't he want to? <laughs> and I flipped this very innocent situation totally on its head. And by the time we got to the temple, I was kind of ticked off. And so I learned that, you know, I have to maybe ask him questions or, or something like that. But what was a restful moment for him became a very tense and upsetting moment for me. And so uh, sometimes, if it's, even if it's not natural to talk, it just helps to talk. Be that open book. Open your book a little more. I think that's a, always a good thing in either direction. Was it still holding your hand? Yeah, but I don't, I think so, unless, unless. A cold hand, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yes, Brother David? Well, I think in relation to that is not making assumptions that you yeah. know what your spouse is thinking, but actually just talking about it. I know I've seen so much bad assumptions <laughs> in the past. And, and we all have. Yeah. And you know, uh, and not in my defense, because I, I should have been talking more. But I was communicating, mm -hmm. just holding her hand. I was communicating that I wanted to be with her. And it's true, most men, women, you may be able to attest to that. We can carry on a conversation without saying a word, just a grunt or two. Yeah, huh? yeah. <laughs> and if you're Italian, you can carry on a whole conversation with just your hands. You ever watch the Italians? So there are a lot of ways to communicate. But you know what we did with that situation? We, 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 got a little, we got a little bag and we put it in the car 
and on, on, in the back, on little pieces of paper, we wrote out more than a hundred little topics, questions. One was, uh, do you remember our first day? Or what would you like to do if you had unlimited money for a vacation? Or what's your favorite scripture? Or on and on. And we wrote out about a hundred of those things. We put them in a bag and we put it in the car. And after a few miles, when the hand holding wasn't enough conversation, we would get her back out and we would pick one out. We would read the question or whatever it was and then we would talk about it. So there are ways around it and Renee was right. I was very content to just enjoy the ride together, but she wasn't and so we had to communicate and find a way that we could both be as content as the other. So now I want you to write on your little card what is your strongest communication skill? Your strongest communication skill. What do you think you do well in the communication? And if one or more would like to share, we'd be glad to listen. I know that we're not trying to uh, trump our own, I mean, blow our own one, but what is a strong communication skill that you might have? Brother, how has the listening skill, which is a very powerful one, yes, brother? Well, okay, let's do it then.
What does it say, Uncle Lord? Okay, it says this. You remember uh, King Lamoni that uh, Aaron taught, and he had a father that Aaron taught. And at one time, Aaron was teaching the king, the king over all the land, and he made this comment. I would give up all that I have to know. To know what? To know God. And now the question that I think we can ask ourselves, what am I willing to give up to have an increase of love in my marriage that is designed, intended to be eternal, to cleave together? What am I willing to do? So that's, that's a question. What am I willing to do? Because as Sister Ellen mentioned, if we don't have a softening of a heart, a contract heart, if we aren't willing to change, then nothing will change. It will just be like it is. So on your piece of paper right now, just write a little comment. What am I willing to do to change, to adjust? What am I willing to do? So I, have I, I was right because Carrie found that scripture. Oh, good. What, Carrie? Alma 22. Alma. Oh, it's Alma 22. And I was saying the Zion, wasn't it? Yeah, it was Alma 22. It is Alma 22. I think it's probably verse 15 and 18. Is that right, Carrie? Oh, thank you, Carrie. Good. How I know we can count on our scriptorium back there. Very good. Thank you. So, what am I willing to do to change, to give up, to have this marriage? Anybody have one? You don't have to share them, but write it down anyway. And it is interesting that, um, that we recognize and accept that there are differences, just like you mentioned, differences in your marriage. Does it mean you're wrong and he's right? Absolutely not. It just means you're different. For most things, most things of a, an eternal nature will be the same. But there will be some things that are different. Let me give you an example, one that it's fairly iconic, I think. Have you ever been out? Maybe you've gone to town. Maybe a movie. I don't know what it is. And on your way home, you will say, honey, would you like to stop and get a milkshake? And what does she say? I, I'm really not interested in a milkshake, but if you want to stop and get one for yourself, go ahead. Maybe I'll just have a five years or you know, three years. Is that what you say? You say, yeah. And so, is that what you say too, Carrie? Yeah. Every time. Every time. And, but in reality, what's the conversation about? I don't know, but I drink half as much. I, I'm, I'm, <laughs> absolutely, I'm absolutely positive to do it for us. It's just like, I'll just have a little sip. And, and so, in my, in my thinking now, I'm just going to order two large. Because I'm, I'm only going to get a half of it anyway, so. So, um, we just, we just think differently. She's thinking, oh, I don't want to bother you. I want to spend my, I don't really need a milkshake. Um, thanks for a while, but no, I don't, no. She's telling, telling the truth. No, but she's what? thinking, it's not on my diet, but it really sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it is. And, and he's thinking, I want to get a milkshake. I really do, but, but I don't want to if she doesn't want to be bothered. She doesn't want to stop, you know, whatever. So, uh, so what's the solution? Brother Jacqueline, what's the solution to that conversation? And, and usually that conversation doesn't end in, hopefully it doesn't end in an argument. It, it always is kind of like, yeah, I don't know what's going to happen here. I'm going to stop and I'm going to have a half a milkshake, and, or I just go home and forgive it. So what's the solution to that uh, discussion? Just go ahead and get the large. Because, you know, supersize it. That's a, that's a good solution. What's another solution? What could the woman, the woman do in this case? Um, she has a one stop. She could offer to make one at home. She could, do, she could do that. That would be a great solution, wouldn't it? You say, hey, let's not stop. We have ice cream at home, and I can make you the best darn milkshake. And I'll still get half. But we can do that. <laughs> That's a good solution. What's another solution? What would you do? What's a good solution? Take him up on the offer because it never happens. <laughs> <laughs> Check his whole job. <laughs> She's thinking it. I'm not saying it. <laughs> Go for it. Jump for it. Yeah. Well, I was thinking about that too. I like, I like the solutions, but 
Maybe you can try this next time. Just, just say, honey, I don't really want a milkshake, but you know I'll have half of yours, but I know you would, so let's stop and get one. What <coughs> flavor are you going to get tonight? Really? You're going to get the super duper chocolate? Well, maybe I will have more than just a sip of yours. But go ahead and go through it. You know that he wants to stop. And so, don't, don't be a closed book. Just open the book and say, great, let's stop and get a milkshake. If you get one from me, I just want a small, but, or I'll just eat half yours, just like I usually do. But let's stop. That'll be fun. Mm -hmm. And go, and go along with it. Or, that's a good solution. But find a solution by communicating. You know he wouldn't have asked, he wouldn't have brought it up, if he probably didn't want a milkshake. He wouldn't have let it go. And he's wanting to do something nice. That's all it is. And you're wanting to be nice too. You don't have to spend $10 on a milkshake for me. We've had a good evening. Let's just go home. You're both trying to be nice, but go ahead and communicate. Open the book and communicate. Find um, out. Yes, I think sir. that a sense of humor is really important in all of these kind of little things. You know, we, we can laugh about those. You know, it's like, anyway, we know what's happening. We know what's going to happen. You know, just enjoy it and make it fun. You know, there's, there's the other one, like, uh, You've just driven around um, a strange city that you're in Detroit or wherever it is, and you can't find your way. And your wife says, I want you to stop and ask directions. Not here. Have you ever done that? Not there. The engineer would do that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Not, not in Detroit. Yeah. I'm not stopping it. Uh, in Detroit. Yeah. Don't, don't stop there. Yeah. Detroit, just go where you know. Have you ever done that? Do you ever wonder why your husband doesn't want to stop and ask directions? Well, no, I just tell him where to go. So it works out right now. <laughs> you know the way. Well, I, I'm one of those that, like, I can find it. I, mean, I know you can, but it's, it's been 45 minutes so far, and I know you'll get there, dear, but we're just different, aren't we? We're just different. And so you can, you can go with it, you can get frustrated, or you can go with it. And uh, go along with it and say, I've been lost before, too. I know you don't want to ask directions, but I don't mind asking directions, so let me ask. Besides, I have to go to the bathroom. So can we just stop and I'm going to take care of it all? I don't know, find a solution, but we're just different. Uh, accept it, acknowledge it, be different, but find a way to communicate peaceably. Destructive thought habits, I think that's a, a tough one too. Sometimes we will, destructive thought habits usually means we're, we're uh, pointing fingers at the weakness of our companion, all the while elevating our strengths. And thinking, well, you know, he, she, whatever it is, really has a problem here, and it's not my problem. I wish she would just get over it, but she won't. So, destructive thought habits. Write down on your piece of paper one of the things that really attracted you to your companion when you were dating. I remember those days and how infatuation and love, early love, maybe immature love, but it was love, how exciting it was, how wonderful it was, beautiful it was. Well, if you ever are in that mood to have a destructive thought habit, get out that piece of paper and remember, I love this woman. I love her with all my heart, just like God asked me to. So, she isn't stupid, she isn't whatever it is I'm thinking, and nor am I as good as I might pretend to be right now. So we get over it. We just don't let those destructive thought habits ruin a marriage. We just can't do that. We can't do it. You know, Sister, how, I don't have a, a watch, and... Uh, it's uh, two minutes. Oh, it's two minutes to go? Okay, we only have 45 minutes left to talk. So we, I'm going to go through a couple of these really quick. I'll, I'll read them, but uh, we don't have time talking about them. Use good communication skills. Be interested and attentive. We already mentioned that. Be a good listener like Brother Howe. Ask questions. Like the uh, closed book, ask questions. See what it is that uh, is on your companion mind. So ask questions, and then be interested in the answers. I have a few more. I'll hurry and read them really quick. 
We already talked about listen act actively. Share intentions. Yeah, share intentions. Use I statements instead of you always do this thing that makes me mad. Instead of I feel hurt when you do that. So don't be aggressive. Don't be um, by using you statements. It's it's um, combative and it's challenging. So use I statements. This is the way I feel. Don't uh, do it the other way. Speak non-defensively and agree with the truth. Be willing to say, I'm sorry. Have you ever had to do that? Sometimes it's difficult. Let's practice right now. Let's just say it together. I'm sorry. Ready? I'm sorry. That's not so hard. I'm sorry. And it doesn't mean that you're wrong. Maybe you are. And maybe you aren't. But I'm sorry that I made you feel this way. I'm sorry about that. And I'll try never to do it again because, because I love you. I'll always love you. So be willing to say, I'm sorry. You have to do that. We have to do that. Speak non uh, defensively. Give honest praise. Remind your spouse of your admiration. Read that piece of paper to her, even tonight, to him. Be admiring and share it often. Um, clearly state preferences. Yes, we have to be an open book. And then examine examine how you talk to each other. There's a process versus content. The content is usually appropriate. The process of discussing that content can be a problem. So we can't let the process um, counteract the importance of the content. So we use good communication <coughs> habits. And then uh, we try to repair our communication by doing the things that work. So if we've had a problem when we drive in the car to Boise, if we keep doing the same thing over and over, maybe that's arguing, maybe it's yelling, maybe it's st uh, it, stonewalling, maybe it's withdrawing. If we keep doing that, We'll keep getting the same results. So just like King Lamoni's father, what am I willing to give or give up to have the marriage that my companion and I have always dreamed about? To have the marriage that I wanted when I first noticed this beautiful girl, this handsome, hardworking man. What am I willing to do? And then tonight, be willing to do it. Be contrived. Let your heart soften and remember this, even with all the good intentions that we have right now, tomorrow we'll bring up issues. Five to one, not a bad ratio. So if you have one, resolve it in a hurry. I'll just tell you one little quick uh, story. I'll try to make it quick. I'll make it as quick as I can. There's a couple, a young man and a young woman, that I know well, and this is the story as I remember it. So if it's exactly like, like this, um, they, they were newlyweds, and uh, he liked uh, his music, and he made some speakers in some speaker boxes. The boxes weren't all that attractive, but the speakers were top line. And she was a decorator, and uh, she noticed the speakers in their little living room, in their little apartment, and she thought, they really don't look good, and they probably didn't, but they sounded so awesome. And she said, maybe we could move them over behind the couch or somewhere. And he's thinking, and distort that sound? <laughs> well, anyway, it, 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 it ended up that there was a little bit of a discussion. And, and it, in time, she went off to the bedroom and curled up in the fetal position on the bed. And he was bewildered, didn't know what to do, called his parents and said, you know, man, grew up with boys, but girls are a little bit different. And this is what happened. And, so it's bound to happen, and the advice was let it go a little bit, and then go in and talk to her. Find, find a happy medium. And so he did. And his comment was when he had enough courage to open the door, he peeked in there, and she was there sobbing. And he just said, Sweetheart, are you going to be mad at me forever? And she said, Of course not. And he said, Well, we just as well get over it right now. And that's 
usually the solution. We're going to be mad at each other forever. Are we going to withdraw forever? Of course not. So, the solution? Let's just get over it right now and practice good communication techniques. We are upon the gospel of Jesus Christ with a softening of heart. I leave you my witness that with that, marriage can be eternal, can be forever, can be what we intended it to be and what we continue to tend, intend it to be. A cleaving together and not a cleaving apart. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen.